Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our time here together, turning for guidance to the teachings of the Christian mystic, Julianne of Norwich. In this session, I want to pick up where we left off in the previous session in chapter 10 of the long text of her book, uh, The Revelations of Divine Love, by noting uh, a distinction she makes towards the end of the chapter. She's reflecting, um, as in each chapter, on her the visions that she had near death of the, the crucified Christ, and finding in the, the meaning of the crucifixion the depth of God's love for us. And she says that we can speak of two activities which can be seen in this vision. One is seeking and the other is contemplating. Seeking is common to all and every soul can have through grace and not to have discretion in the teachings of the Holy Church. And then in the midst of the seeking, uh, there can be granted a contemplation, which is the, the mystical experience. And so, uh, earlier in the chapter, the, in the previous session we were talking, is that um, she speaks of seeking as we might say, uh, the way God customarily works in our life, the way we customarily uh, are, are graced with the experience of God, the understanding of God, and the ways we respond to God in our life, and saying that I, I saw him, and I sought him, and I had him, and I lacked him. And this is and should be our ordinary understanding in this life as I see it. And so we were saying last time that there was that I saw him refers, we can look back to our first awakening of the spiritual life. The very first time we were quickened with a sense where God's presence became personally meaningful to us. And then as that initial awakening dissipated, it left within us a longing to abide in the awareness of God's oneness with us, which, which is the impetus of the path. And so I sought him, having tasted God's oneness with myself. It moved me to seek to abide in, in the habitual experience of God's oneness with me in all things, God's oneness with all of us. And in seeking him, I had him. That is, in the midst of the seeking, we're graced again with the touch of God. We're quickened within with the renewed sense of the God's oneness with us that is always there. And then I lacked him. It, it dissipates again. And the lack only to set in motion uh, a, a renewed longing, knowing that our longing for God is, a, is an incarnate echo of God's longing for us. And so such is this path that we do, we follow. And so when we... we read these mystics when we read Julian or with us as we, we listen to her, to her teachings. We're trying to align our heart with hers. So our intention in reading her or listening to her is in concert with her intention of writing what she says to us. And her intention is to help us along this path, this path path of, of discipleship, this path of seeking God's presence uh, in our life. And I would say, too, it seems to me, that we could say this devotional life, this daily quiet time, this regrounding of ourselves in God's presence, which then spills over into every aspect of our life as an habitual underlying gratitude or respond to or understand each situation as Christ would and with love and so forth. But this happens in, in, the, in the good times. And in the blessings of life. So if, if we're blessed with a happy marriage in the midst of one, it's incarnate in the, in the gift of our marriage. If we have children, it's incarnate in the gift of our children. Whether our love relationship with our parents or our grandparents, with our friends, with the gift of our daily work, our service to the community, the midst of nature, the, the goodness of life in, in this world. And uh, but Julian notes this path of God in which we seek God in the good times in our devotional sincerity, 
she says that the contemplation takes place in the mystical, in the sense in which, this is where she uses this image of dropping down into the bottom of the ocean that up on the surface where the winds blow about and caught up in this and that and the circumstances of the day. But when, we, when we're having our daily rendezvous with God, we're in a state of quiet attentiveness. We can feel ourselves undergoing a kind of a descent. And in the descent, we feel ourselves dropping down into a deeper awareness of and oneness with deeper dimensions of God's oneness with us in this quiet descent. And this quiet descent can reach a point of the mystical contemplation where we drop down into the bottomless abyss of God's oceanic love for us, God. So here's this mystical sense of this, is that it isn't just that God's in us, it's also true that we're in God. And so, from all of eternity, uh, God the Father, in this Trinitarian language of the Christian tradition, God the Father is eternally expressing and contemplating himself in the Word, contemplating himself in the Word, and contemplating in the Word the mystery of you, of who you are, and are called to be, in sharing in God's own life as perfectly as God shares in God's life. So when God breathes you onto the earthly plane, for a very short time, really, basically to learn how to love. And then in God's good time, God inhales, and we return home to this abyss of love. And so there's this manifested self through faith, we're walking, we're passing through our days here on this earth. But all the while, we don't cease to be in God, in a, in a hidden self, hidden with Christ and God forever. So what happens in, in the ocean, is in mystical state, is we drop down into who we are in the interdivine life of God, hidden with Christ and God forever, in this state of mystical union, intimately realize it's always there. Not in the full glory that awaits us when we pass through the veil of death, but in some obscure way, uh, this infinite intimacy, this a communal uh, presence is intimately realized, see, this contemplative state. And this contemplative state then, when we experience it in our prayer, in our devotion, however it comes to us, sometimes this quickening is very intense, and, but sometimes it's extremely subtle. In the midst of nature, the arms of the beloved, the presence of a child, the pause between two lines of a poem, uh, a quiet hour at day's end. Our heart is grazed with this oneness of a oneness with God, this beginningless and endless and boundaryless in all directions, intimately realized, resting in God. And then as it dissipates, it, it hallows our day. We go through our day kind of seeing everything's more translucent to this love that is always there and the events of the day, our relationships and so on. But Julian is saying, you know, this also takes place in, in the world, not just in the good times of blessings, but also takes place in the world in, in the midst of suffering. As a matter of fact, as we know from the first session we had with Mirabai and in the previous session too, is that her mystical awakening, the dropping down into the ocean, happened in the midst of, of a traumatized state. She was dying. She was dying, and, and at the edge of death, as a priest holds up the crucifix, that's where she dropped down into the, into the depths of the ocean, into this oceanic love. And what she was able to see, the mystery of the cross, is the mystery of God's love for us, uh, revealed in the mystery of Christ crucified. And likewise, this can happen to us. I, I know myself, my own awakening occurred. I was very young, three years old, I think four took place an ongoing severe trauma, a violent, traumatizing uh, alcoholic father. And so sometimes this happens. It can happen on a battlefield. It can happen in immense loss or pain. We can be delivered from the tyranny of suffering in the midst of suffering, like a, a strange liberation or an awakening. So it comes as it comes, happens as it happens. And she was keenly aware of this. Uh, 
of the suffering of the world. You know, during her lifetime, there was the bubonic plague, a truly painful death that just swept through and killed many, many people. She saw that. Uh, during this time, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury was murdered. During this time in the church, there were three popes, and each pope excommunicated the other two popes. And during this time, uh, there was a hundred years war with France. So she was keenly aware of the suffering and the crisis of the world. Also, the people who came to the window to talk with her for spiritual direction, I'm sure they unburdened on her with their struggles and their fears and so on. And so I think this is where Julian can be especially helpful to us because we're so aware of the traumatizing age that we live in. A time of uh, political strife and contention, war, the brutalities of war, the violence of a prejudice, threats to the environment. We're sensitized to these things just to turn on the television. And so how do we then learn to be a healing presence in the midst of an all too often traumatized and traumatizing world? See, how can Julian's insight into the mystery of the cross as God's loving oneness with us be, help us to stay grounded and present in the midst of the suffering? that not be so easily thrown or overwhelmed by it in our ongoing sensitivity and response to it. It is at this point, then, that um, she turns to the, to the story of Veronica's veil, and um, she's, she's speaking about her vision that she had, the second revelation of the face of Christ. And she, she notes how in that ecstatic state, like a waking dream, she saw his face disfigured he was being he was beaten. Uh, there, was, there was blood from the crown of thorns. Spittle, there was where they spat on his face. There was the dirt. She saw his face. And then she said in this ecstatic state, it seemed as if his face was changing colors. This reminds her, she says, it made me think of the holy vertical in Rome, the holy veil, Veronica's veil, which he imprinted with his own blessed face when, when he was in his cruel passion, voluntarily going to his death, and of his often changing color, the brownness and the blackness, his face sorrowful and wasted. And uh, she then later on in the chapter refers, refers to it again. And as it concerns the, the, the veil in Rome, Veronica's veil, it changes its color and appearance. There's rumors that this, the relic of that veil, Veronica's veil, change color, just like the face of Christ changed colors in her ecstatic state. And she sees a certain significance in this. This taught me to understand that the soul's constant searching pleases God greatly. So I'd like to reflect on this, because it's, uh, it's not easily, uh, it's not readily apparent how this applies to us and what this is about. So first, the story of Veronica's veil. You know, in the in Catholic churches, in the Roman Catholic churches of the world, there are the Stations of the Cross, uh, uh, 14 stations, seven on each side of the two sides of the church. And each station is a moment of Christ's death. Of Christ. So the first station is Jesus is condemned by Pilate. Then Jesus is scourged. Jesus is crowned with thorns. Jesus falls and, and so on. It's all the way through to uh, Jesus' death. And uh, Pope John Paul II has suggested the church is at a 15th station and put the resurrection there, the resurrection of Jesus, to round out the circle of our life in Christ. And so the story of Veronica, all these scenes are in the gospel except for one, which is one of the stations, I think it's the sixth station, which is Veronica's veil. It's a very early tradition, kind of in the Catholic imagination and um, found its way into the story of Jesus' death. And the story is this. The story is, is that um, Jesus is carrying his cross and the soldiers are beating him and the crowds are lining the narrow streets jeering and yelling and so forth. Veronica's in the crowd and as she sees Jesus going by, she steps out of the crowd 
and hands Jesus the only thing she can offer is her veil. This was a, a, a risky thing because it was very risky to even acknowledge that you were related to Jesus' work at all for fear that they might do to you what they were doing to him. This is why Peter for denied Christ three times. But the thing is in this story, her love was greater than her fear. And I like to think of this like a waking dream or a scene in a play or a parable that sheds light on her own life. Let's reflect on this story in this way that Julian invites us to reflect on, as she did. So uh, Veronica steps out and offers the only thing she has, which is her veil. Jesus takes the veil and he presses his face into her veil. And so the softness of her veil is the only solace Jesus could find in a world turned harsh. Also in this moment, when Jesus presses his face into her veil, uh, the world around him disappeared. It's just like with you, if you close your eyes and lower your head and place your face in, your, in the open palms of your hands, with your eyes closed and your face pressed in the palms of your hand, the room around you disappears. So in this moment then, Jesus with his face in her veil like this, and we might say, really, the fabric of the veil is the fabric of our lives. That in this moment, and here, here's, here's the poetry of this, that in this moment was Jesus is like this, with his face in the veil. Jesus, without going anywhere, dropped down into the bottomless abyss of God's infinite love for him and oneness with him in God. Because he was in all of this, uh, the Word made flesh, and uh, Jesus drops down without going anywhere into the abyss of God. And Veronica, in this moment, without going anywhere, drops down into the bottomless abyss of God. And the soldiers beating Jesus, whipping him, they, without going anywhere, drop down into the bottomless abyss of God. And the jeering crowd, everyone there, drops down into the bottomless abyss of God. And you and I, right now as I speak, we drop down to the bottomless abyss of God, in whom we live and move and have our being. So that our manifested self, uh, in the midst of the, the time and the situation which you're listening to this, the situation and time I'm saying this, we're, we're in the circumstances, but in the deep down depths, there is a place deeper, 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 deeper in this oneness of God sustaining oneness with us, the life that is at once God's and our own, in divinus, in God. It is this life in God then welling up and giving itself to us and manifesting itself in our life that is our faith, it's our insight, it's our consolations, it's our reassurances, uh, it's our inspirations and motivations and insights. And when we pause for our daily rendezvous with God in prayer, the, the, this manifested presence of God, as the silence deepens, we drop down into this mysterious divinity of this silent communion with God. This is kind of the poetry of this, of this contemplation, this, this communion with God. So here's how it seems to me, how I would see this, of understanding Jesus and our suffering and God's love for us in Christ. Julian speaks of God's familiarity with us, that God so loves us, God has moved in Christ to be one with us, not just in the good times, but to one with us and share with us and to become our suffering. And so the story would go this way then. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night that he was going to be arrested, uh, Jesus knew what was about to happen to him because he saw crucifixions. He saw how violent and brutal they were. And he was in the bottomless abyss of God but in his kenosis, he did not consider his equality with God a condition to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. He gave up his ability to know of himself subsisting in the depths of God. And like us, he was terrified. 
let this cup, if possible, let this cup pass from me. So it's just like us in our moments of impending trauma. I hope you've never had to go through that, a life threatening of being overwhelmed where you're about to be raped or beaten or killed or betrayed or a loved one going going through some horrendous circumstances that's impending, it's about to happen, and you can't stop it. All the while, we're, we're subsisting in the depths of God, but we're so overwhelmed, are we, by the pain, we can't experience it. As a matter of fact, when we're traumatized, we're so overwhelmed, we can't even experience ourselves. We lose this felt sense of God's oneness with us, and there's this kind of white-hot heat of the, the, the impending trauma we're powerless to stop as we're sustained by God in the midst of the trauma. Likewise, when the trauma was actually occurring at its worst, say when he, he was being nailed to the cross, all the while he was in the bottomless abyss, abiding in God's love. But out of love for us, he gave up, he emptied himself, his ability to know that, and there was only the anguish of uh, the nightmare uh, beyond words. Just like with us, if, if we have to endure a life-threatening, overwhelming moment, we don't have a sense of God. We don't have a sense of ourselves. It's just, it's just suffering beyond words, or a loved one going through that and the suffering beyond words. Then as Jesus is hanging on the cross, so overwhelmed with, with the agony and the pain, betrayal, he loses his faith. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I was just discussing this with two friends of mine I went to doctoral work with. We were talking about Julian together. And this one person, one of the three of us, who's also a minister, their minister, he says, no, he, he doesn't think Jesus lost the ability to, he didn't lose his faith, but he lost his ability to uh, feel the presence of God that he believed in. And I'd like to say that he lost his faith for us, just like we lose ours, but God never loses faith in us. But however, see, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Just like, just like with us, we're abiding in God all the while, but in the terrible nightmarish hour, see, we lose our, we lose our faith. And God sustains us heartbeat by heartbeat, breath by breath, never letting go of us as we lose our sense of God's presence in our life. And then in a moment, the thief being crucified with him, remember me when you come into your kingdom, this day you'll be with me in paradise. All of a sudden, there's a kind of quiet sovereignty of love. We're so moved by this with a kind of an unquestioning assurance, you'll be with me. And I think sometimes what happens, we can be just lost in suffering. But sometimes our love for another person, our love for another person uh, empowers us to have something opens up within us. And something of this love we can no longer feel for our own sake. We can assure and offer an assurance to the person that we can't offer to ourselves. I think that happens. And then when he dies, see, into your hands I commend my spirit. He hands himself over to the God that he, that he could no longer find. And so what we have here then, it seems to me, is something um, worth meditating on and worth reflecting on for ourselves. I mean, surely in our commitment to follow God, we should be grateful for the blessings of the good times. Surely, knowing the God-given godly nature of the gift of life, we should be a non-violent, nurturing, protective person. And surely, wherever there is suffering, uh, we should be moved by the grace of God to reach out to touch the suffering with love. Surely, we should. Surely, we should. And we should do our best not to lose our groundedness in God or not to lose our groundedness in God's oneness with us. But to know that life is such, because we're just a human being, we unravel and we, we lose our way. And all as we lose our way, we know that in the cross of Christ is the revelation that God loses, God, Jesus lost his way for our sake and is one with us in losing 
our way and uh, is not losing us at all. See, this is why I say God is a presence that protects us from nothing, even as God unexplainably sustains us in all things. We seek to be a healing presence in the midst of the world, in a peace that's not dependent on the outcome of the effort, because it's the peace of God on which everything depends. It sustains us unexplainably. Remember the prayer by Thomas Merton when we were uh, exploring Thomas Merton? My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. And he says that and even though I walk through the valley of death, I will not fear, for you are always with me, and you will not leave me to face my perils alone. There's this confidence, invincible confidence, of God's confidence in us, and even as our confidence wavers. And there's some, there's a certain holy kind of tenderness about this, a certain mercy about this, that I think um, uh, we, we sit with it. Notice this is not a method. This is not a way to pray, or this is not, whatever, this is, this is something, Julian is so, such an amazing woman. She's so, where she takes us to this place of this oneness of birth, that we tend to think the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ is three phases. But what if they're collapsed as the true nature of the present moment? What if birth and death and sorrow and joy and uh, are all intermingled in this, in this alchemy of, of a graced life, and a sometimes beautiful, but sometimes brutal and... Uh, scary world. So uh, with that then, let's sit with this. You can see for me, uh, Julian so strikes me because she touches these deep places inside of us. It's so evocative because it touches your history, it touches my history uh, on where are we with this. I want to say something else too uh, with Julian. Uh, I might have mentioned this in the first talk, I can't remember. You know, in the, in the previous mystics that we were doing, Thomas Burton, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Guigo, the ladder to heaven, and the cloud of unknowing, I've been very immersed in these mystics for years, since I was in the monastery, really. Julian is, is new to me. I've known of her since the, the, the monastery. But um, she, she's, she's new to me. I'm a slow learner. So I, I'm kind of just, just sitting with trying to take in what comes to me as a beginner uh, for the guidance that she offers. So uh, I guess I thank you for your patience with me as I struggle for these deep and beautiful and, uh, and, and mysterious mysteries of life and death revealed to us in Christ and our faith life. So with this then, uh, let's bring this to meditation. God. I invite you to sit straight, fold your hands in prayer, and bow, repeating after me, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Mary, Mother of Contemplatives, pray for us. The author of The Cloud of Unknowing, pray for us. Julianne of Norwich, pray for us. Blessings till next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Centre for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions. So if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.